It is seven o'clock and I'll call to order this meeting of the Waterbury Select Board on Monday, October 7th, 2024. First item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to approve the agenda with an amendment, which is to move our consent agenda items um, to our select board meeting on October 21st. Okay. okay, any discussion? Uh, essentially, we're just uh, looking, the minutes didn't get uh, back in time for them to be posted on Friday. So moving on to uh, our next meeting. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. The agenda is approved as amended. Uh, next is the public uh, session. Anyone wishing to address anything not on the warned agenda can please step forward. And I ask you to uh, try to keep your comments to three minutes if possible. Anything more than that, we can uh, put it on a future meeting agenda. I'll, uh, uh, I got Kane first and then Mike. I just want to thank the construction crews who just finished the bridge on Guppo Road with expediency um, and getting that done before paper season hit its peak. Uh, <laughs> was, uh, no, I can't imagine it was a small feat, but they got it done. Us folks who live on or adjacent to Gunshot Road are very appreciative. Like, I just want to give a big thanks to the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Uh, this Tuesday, they had their town fair. I know myself and Alicia and um, several of the uh, town staff, including Tom, attended. There were some excellent workshops. I would encourage, you know, folks in future ones. It, it's all, I've, I've attended a lot of them, both as a presenter as well as um, a vendor and well as an attendee. And I think it's, it's, it's well worth for town people. Just, I get as much for the interchange with my fellow uh, select board and town, town clerks and stuff like that. I think it's really good, but the league deserves a big thumbs up for do, doing a great job. All right, anyone else? All right, we'll move on. Uh, next item on the agenda is the um, audit presentation by Sullivan Powers and Company. And we've got uh, uh, someone online. Rick. Rick online. Rick, uh, thank you for uh, your packet. Uh, no problem. Provide a lot of weekend reading for us. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, if you wouldn't mind just uh, going through and letting us know uh, some of the highlights of, uh, of the audit to, to this year. That sounds good. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes, we can. Okay, great. So yeah, let me let me just thumb through a few of the few of the highlights of the audit. First, let's start with uh, pages one through four. So there's a lot of information going on in this report, obviously 64 pages. Um, one of the key highlights that we always like to try to initiate when we give you the engagement letter and when we give you the report is if you look at page two, top paragraph, this whole 64 page report is really um, the responsibility of management to prepare to uh, have all the numbers to put this report together. We do assist the staff there to put this report together, but the, uh, the responsibility for the preparation and how this report gets put together and all the um, numbers are in it really relies with management. My job as your auditor is to basically give an opinion on this 64 page financial statement as to whether it's fairly stated or not. So in, in this uh, four pages, you basically have three choices. You could have an adverse opinion saying the financial statements are not fairly stated. Uh, you could have a qualified opinion saying the financial statements are fairly stated except for something or some things. Um, but the best opinion to have is an unqualified opinion with no qualifications and no adverse opinion. And that's what the town of Waterbury achieved once again. Um, I I always like to congratulate my uh, my 
my uh, clients when they achieve this because not all of them do, and it's a it's a lot of work to get to this point and to get to an unqualified opinion. And so, uh, again, a real tribute to the staff there who helped put all this together and give us all the information for the audit report. If we're looking at, uh, if we're looking, the next thing I'd like to look at at pages seven and eight, these are your major funds for the town. Um, this is the, if you're looking at page seven, this is the balance sheet, which is basically a snapshot in time at June 30, 2024 of your assets and liabilities well, by all the different funds. So for example, we're looking at the first column, which is the general fund, which is what everybody mostly focuses on. So these are your assets and liabilities with your coming down to your total fund balances of 370,089. That's usually the, mo the number most people focus on. Um, the unassigned fund balance of just above that of 202023 is a, um, a good healthy um, fund balance compared to last year, which was a negative 5,211. So obviously building there and looking positive. Um, looking at the other uh, funds here, the rest of them look fairly healthy. I know last year the uh, Highway Capital Fund had a big deficit, which I know you've been funding over time. And uh, that is now down to 268,000 from last year was about 591,000. So again, making that deficit uh, slowly go away. But the rest of the funds, uh, you can look right across. Uh, those are pretty healthy fund balances. If you're looking at uh, page eight, that's basically the income statement for all those same funds showing all the revenues and expenses that came in for those funds for the year. Nothing that really stuck out to me um, in there that I wanted to point out, but I wanted to let you know where that is. So, so the uh, pages seven and eight are base are the fund financial statements. If you take the fund financial statements and then add into it all the debt, fixed assets, um, and do some accrual base adjustments, you would get to what we call the government wide, which is pages uh, five and six. Those are what we call the government wide financials. It basically treats your uh, town like a business. How would your business look on a full accrual basis with fixed assets and debt? Same kind of thing, page seven, page five is the balance sheet of the town as of 6-30-23, or June, uh, sorry, December 31, 23. And then the next page would be the revenues and expenses that came in for December 31, 23 as well. So as we're looking through, you're gonna get to pages 12 through 40. Those are the what we call the notes to the financial statement. If you're looking for a deep... Uh, Chuck, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was just wondering, uh, any change in the uh, net position uh, from last year to this year? And uh, any assessment of that? From, uh, for the general fund, you mean? For the general fund? Yeah. Yeah, so if, if you're looking, again, back to pages seven and eight, um, the total fund balances last, this year are 370000 um, last year was 303,000. So the total fund balance went up 66,000. But to me, the big, bigger and more important thing was the unassigned amount. Last year was negative 5,311. And this year it's up to 202,000. So there's a, that's a good healthy jump from where it was last year. A little tight last year. This has a little bit of, a little bit of room in it. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, as I was saying, so when you're looking at pages 12 through 40, these are the what we call the notes to the financial statements. If you're looking for a deeper dive on what makes up the notes payable, leases, obligations, capital assets, depreciation, what cash is collateralized versus uninsured, what, the, what are the different fund balances, what can they be used for? These notes will give you a real deep dive into any of those issues or any of those questions you may have. If you're looking for something specific, whether you're looking at the balance sheet or income statement, I, I recommend you kind of go to these notes because it'll give you a lot of, 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 of real deep information that will uh, hopefully answer any questions you have. Looking at pages 41 through 50, this is your, your budget actual for the year. 
you've probably seen this many times during many of the board meetings during the year as far as what did we budget, what did we have actual, how did the year go? So I'm not going to get much into the to the results of that specifically, but um, these these will give you if you're looking down and wanting to see what revenues you budgeted versus what you ex uh, what you received, and the same thing with expenses versus what you actually spent. Uh, this report will give you a lot of great information on that. But again, I think you've seen it many times throughout the year um, in dealing with uh, your normal board meetings and looking at budget reports. Mm -hmm. One one quick note: I did send an email about this. Uh, but on page 41, um, three lines down, it's a tax penalty, which the town collected with over $46,000 last year. Mm -hmm. That was 30 grand just a few years ago. And I'm, I'm watching it closely this year. Um, as it stands right now, compared to the last few years, our delinquencies are up. We really don't know until the final payment, but it's a bit of, it's a, bit of a sign of economic times that, well, you know, no one, pays an 8% penalty, unless they can avoid it. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like this is some of the pinch of the school increase that we're starting to see this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, you expect some of that we're not gonna see? No, I think we will see a high penalty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. um, we'll see a high penalty, we'll have to collect it eventually. Um, it also impacts our liquidity. If we're not if we're not paying the taxes, we make the schools whole anyway. So nothing is gonna be traumatic, but it's interesting that um, yeah, you know, it's revenue for the town, but it's also just a sign of where the economy is. Mm -hmm. right. That's a real good, uh, real good notation there because I'm actually seeing that with a lot of my clients this year and going into this year, same results. So I don't think this is just to you guys. It's obviously through most of the municipalities that I've been dealing with. I'm seeing those same kind of issues. Um, so just kind of going on, if you're looking at pages 54 through 61. If you're looking for the smaller funds, the uh, records restoration, community development, reappraisal, again, these uh, these pages have the same kind of information, the balance sheet for each of these smaller funds and the income statement showing the revenues and expenses for each of the funds. Um, again, most of the fund balances there look pretty healthy, not seeing any negatives there. So I think those are all in pretty good shape. Um, and looking at the page, at the, uh, page 64. So as part of our process for dealing with uh, um, with doing the audit, we're supposed to identify any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies that we know in dealing with the audit. Um, one of the things we, we did, we did have some balance sheets that needed some adjustments a year end when we came in. So anytime an auditor comes in and kind of proposes adjustments, you usually there's usually going to be a finding that relates to that. So there were a few balance sheet accounts that um, weren't reconciled at the 12, 31, 23 year end. Um, I think a lot of those are happening, you know, your regular cash accounts, all that's being reconciled, but it's the stuff that you do basically one time a year, booking your receivables, booking your deferreds, um, all those kinds of things that, you know, uh, it's really just trying to get a process in place to make sure all those things get reconciled and booked at the year end. Um, we're working with your staff uh, to make sure those get corrected for this year. Um, they've given us a response to this and it looks like that we're, we're going to all work towards making this finding go away for next year. When do those need to be uh, reconciled, Rick? Well, again, there's certain things that get reconciled every month, you know, payroll withholdings, cash accounts, accounts payable. But at the end of the year, when you're booking like retainage payables, you're booking receivables from grants, you're booking deferreds, those usually only happen once a year. And so at June 30th, you start to put those reconciliations together usually, or I'm sorry, December, I keep forgetting your December year end. So at December year end, you usually have a couple months to put that stuff together. And so uh, usually by, you know, March, that stuff's all reconciled. By like town meeting day, for example? Typically, yeah, that we'd like to have that just so you guys have some idea where your fund balance lies. Mm -hmm. I think a big struggle this past year was, was trying to estimate SEMA. Yes, exactly. We get back. Um, other required communications. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Rick. Uh, Mike's got a question. Um, is Michelle working on 
updating like balance references? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the good news is I, I think that the normal stuff, um, yeah. So payroll is weekly, and they take portions right. of our paycheck for withholdings to pay the taxes, things like that. I think all that is is routine and generally fine. It's it's um, I think what's be devil lost for a while are things like the grant receivables. FEMA added on to that every year, and I guess technically there is a FEMA grant. Um, but some of those, um, again, some of those oddball things you might just do once a year. Okay. Now, I know the downtown grant, which began a long time ago, um, we're still, I think we're still due a few thousand dollars from that. So it's, hmm. we're still finally closing out all those things. And some of it's tough with, um, just with the change in staff, and not have yeah, to do uh, sidewalks and other unfinished business, right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Rick. Go ahead. No problem. Um, just other required communications that I'm supposed to communicate. Um, we encountered no difficulties in dealing with the staff in management during our course of the audit. There were no disagreements with staff or management. There were no consultations with other auditors. And all entries that we proposed were posted to these financial statements, so there were no unposted entries. Overall, we were very pleased with the process and how the audit went, and we want to thank uh, both management and staff for all the help they gave us during the process. Uh, it went very smoothly and felt that it had a good good result. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, questions from the board? No? Uh, no? No? No. Can I uh, Tom. just say one thing? Um, folks want to go to page seven. Um, so if you look in the center of the page, there's the tax stabilization fund. Um, and that fund balance is classified as mostly non-spendable and some restricted. So the restricted is actually internal loans. That's actually some of the debt you approve killing with the local option tax fall on that. And the non-spendable is because some years ago, I don't know when, but I think a, about a decade ago, the voters on town meeting day um, essentially put in a control in the tax stabilization fund which says you can't spend it without their approval. Mm, yep. Except for 5%, you can skim off the top to put as revenue towards your budget, which has been the pattern historically. Um, something I started thinking about with the local option tax is um, that vote increasingly feels like it's a little bit dated because you have this decent slug of cash every year that's unrestricted. Mm -hmm. uh, at least as of now, it's unrestricted. So part of me seems like it's, it's odd and others that there's a million dollars of restricted what you have. 75% of that coming in every year that's not restricted. So mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting any change there at town meeting day. I'm just suggesting that um, maybe in a few years we think about um, some a different approach there. So effectively, the local option tax is a secondary tax stabilization fund. Yes. Right. Yes. Is there anything different that you would like to do with those funds? No, I just think, um, you know, you certainly should always have a tax stabilization fund. Um, and you should be very careful about committing the local option tax for the long term. Um, you know, sometimes they have a local option tax and they use it to service debt. So you may issue 20 year debt. Your portion of your tax is just set aside now for a long time. Um, but it occurs to me that with the flexibility of blocking tax and with this million dollar tax stabilization fund, if at some point there's a capital project that we would need to borrow for, well, I might advise you to consider the tax stabilization fund as a down payment. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily all of it, but. Yeah, it's always cheaper to uh, borrow from yourself, right? Just less protective of it now that the local option tax is here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, how about. Uh, the number of small uh, accounts that we have uh, that uh, we're just talking about uh, pages 61 to yeah. yeah. So I mean, it's a lot of small amounts of money. Uh, does all of this make sense? Yes. Um, part of it is there, there's so many. <laughs> 
different pots of revenue. So, so the town historically budgets every year for reappraisal and transfers some money into a fund. So you create a separate fund for that. Quirks get a certain percent of quirks revenue is dedicated for record preservation. So that goes into a separate pot of funds. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, over time, you always seem to develop new funds and create new funds. Well, it's the rule of the rule of government, I think. <laughs> well, I'm questioning the rule of government. <laughs> But you 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 think it's appropriate to, to have all, uh, all these separate funds if there's good. I think it's appropriate because it's more transparent again. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Is that your any your experience, Rick? That the... Yeah, a, a lot of towns uh, have even way more um, uh, smaller funds than you do. So I okay. I don't I think the the number feels appropriate for the size of the town and the kinds of things you guys are trying to uh, get accomplished. So uh, I've never looked at it and thought, oh, we should have less or have more. It feels like you guys are right at the right level for where you're at. And some of it's great. You know, a lot of you get the, the reappraisal funds. Um, the town in recent years has sent some general fund taxpayer money into the reappraisal fund, but there's also money you get from the state each year that in theory you're supposed to save for reappraisal. I dare say a lot of towns don't do that. They just treat it as a revenue for their budget. So the fact that we've got a reappraisal fund with a few branded mm -hmm. mm -hmm. means we're in great shape. So we're not coming to you. We're coming to the voters and town meeting day saying we're starting yeah. to reappraisal. We have a little guy at all. You know, four cent tax increase to pay for it. That would not be popular. <laughs> yeah. So some of these things are great. You can just go ahead and say we've got the resources already. Okay. Right. Again, any other questions for Rick? Rick, thank you so much for taking the time here uh, to explain the, the whole audit report. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for the good news that uh, the town's been cooperative and uh, we look to be in good shape. Sounds good. Thanks. Have a great day. Yeah, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, my... I just want to, uh, for the record, thank the entire town staff yeah. on doing an outstanding job. You know, audits. For no fun. Uh, oh. you know, we waited for to leave. No, I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what anyone says. Audits are no fun when you have a bunch of auditors around. But it sounds like our staff did an ultra professional job, and they really need to be commended for what they did. And this report seems to be outstanding. So, thank you, guys. Yeah. Well, it's my last name. <laughs> Next item uh, is the housing task force update. Joe, do you want to uh, come and lead us through your, uh, your proposal? Speaking of, speaking of new funds, oh. <laughs> right now, but I wanted to make room. I might have to do something. Uh, yeah, I think you got to allow me to share the screen. Yeah, or I can just make more posts, um, right? Isn't that yeah, else? I like this. So, so I post you. Yep, make posts. There you go. Sorry, I gave your slide deck to Tom. It was just a little less for me to manage, so that's okay. What happens if I do that? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Next, I have to. They do have the board has a printed version. So first of the, 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 the version of the spot because it's not going to be there. That's why I'm going to do that. All right, where's the share screen? It's at the bottom of the page. There we go. Thank you, Tom. This is humbling. This is how I am. Right, so we're going to be the entire time at a big break reading. Nice. Look at that. So what I wanted to do before we got into the truck bump approval was just to give kind of an overview of some of the data working task force. We started this several months ago, but we're asked by the planning commission recently to provide an update for the uh, for their town plan for their three year town plan. So I just wanted to review that data with you because I think it does set the stage for uh, the recommendation for the trust bump. And you know, not to spoil anything, I'm not going to tell you anything we don't know. 
I'm not, you know, we know that our population is growing and our housing stock is not, and that's called the reporting mortgage. But what I hope that you get from the presentation is an understanding of the magnitude of those trends. Okay, and I think those trends exist in magnitude and also how we are comparing to the county and the state as a whole and so the trend. I think that is worthwhile to see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You just say well, so in general, our population of Waterbury is in the population growth is outpacing both the county and the state. So you can see that over the past decade that we have grown by 5.2%, staying only 1.2%, the county by even less than that. <laughs> Um, I'm going to be showing when I when you see data like 2000, 2010, 2020. That's the that's the U.S. Census decade, um, decade census. So it's a fairly reliable source of information. The challenge is that something changed in 2020, and and we don't have decade, we don't have census data that goes beyond that. We don't have a for like another six years. So you'll see that sometimes, and I'll point that out when you use other data to kind of help them tell the story. Yeah, right. So population growth is, is growing very healthy, 5.2 percent. Um, yeah. yeah, so it's also in terms of our total households are up to over 2,300. But the next slide actually tells the story more on our household growth. So we are growing um, twice as fast as the county is, on the whole is growing. These are households. So. When we talk about housing, there's households and there's housing. Households are people. They're people who could be a single person, it could be roommates, it could be family, they live together, right? Housing units are property buildings. Okay, so this uh, our households are are growing um, at six point percent, which is about the same as the state of Vermont. So it's kind of even though our population is going a lot faster. Are the number of households that we're seeing developing is all the same as as you stated, and about twice that of the county. Was it? Okay. Aren't households growing faster than the population? They are. Yes. Um, that's because you could already be living here. So, for example, your children could actually get houses. So, they would not mind the duck dog. For example, right? Then. You know, the population in the room is already in the population with the household. <laughs> um, but the next two slides begin to look a little bit at, you know, the income. Then. So the first thing is <laughs> notice that our median income is actually um, higher than the county around us and also that of Vermont, which I understand historically is. The people tell me that's not surprising. We've already known that. We know that Waterbury is more affluent than the surrounding county. But what's actually interesting is the next slide. Real, um, real quick, yeah. um, Phil. Um, if two unrelated people rent an apartment together, that's yeah. considered a household frame. Yeah. 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 Um, is that although it's, it continues to increase, you know, it's, you know, we increased by 40% in the last decade, where Vermont only by 22% That's all. So it's double, you know. So we're seeing population growth, we're seeing household growth, and we're seeing growth in affluence here. So it's kind of, I don't want to say the growth is a how that group, you know, I, I can't say that for sure, but we're becoming more affluent. And, Nothing really dramatically has changed regarding household size. So this was a, a data table that was in the old community plan, so I'll have to look at it again. It pretty much isn't the same. You can have to skip it over, but I can get out. Um, okay. So let's look a little bit at the housing unit. So we have in Waterbury, you know, 22,559, if you recall the number of four house was 2,347, something like that, okay? The difference is seasonal housing, okay? So we have more housing than households because we have seasonal housing, okay? That kind of gives you the, the, the idea of the order of magnitude of, of that, but again, 
On the next slide, what we see is that up to 220, that the addition of our housing units were outpacing both the county and the state. We, but it wasn't as high as it was. So in 2010, in the previous decade, we were adding about 13.2%. You know, it actually reduced down to 7.3, but it was still more than what the um, what we saw in the county and the state. So now here's where I said, well, that's really great, but things changed in 2020. So what could we look at? So now this next slide. Just just a quick question. Um, this 2010 growth rate is so high. Um, folks who were here, um, was there something big to influence that the downstream build? All of their units during that period, you know, was there some a big complex put in? I'm just curious if that was community wide or was that a couple of big developments? Uh, it could have been like Bluff that Hill, cool? that's 60 units combined with a bunch of different developments. Uh, homes that yeah. were built on Carrie and Tyler. I'm just well, those probably aren't that old. But those units on Bluff Hill might be. Yeah, it's a lot of properties. Yep. I'm just curious, I'm like, throwing yeah. darts. I have no idea. Yeah, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. And I don't know when Lad, Lad Hall was completed. Uh, in 16. That was hmm? post wasn't it? I think so. Yeah, 2016. It does. So that's 10 years, right, Joe? So like 279 is averaging 28 a year? Yes. New units? Yes, yes, yes. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what? The next slide does is tries to look at what's happened since 2020. I think when we look at the households and we talk about population increasing and things like that, I don't, I don't think we debate that those trends have continued. It's not actually even accelerated. We don't really have any way to tell. But we tried to, when we start talking about our housing stock, we try to get, get a handle on that. And Gary has sent me the permit information for the past couple of years, 2022, 23, and 2024, it's up to the end of July. Okay. So any now. Is that, um, is there, are those all permits that includes like decks and no, so sheds? Well, she said all permits. Mm -hmm. And that little footnote down the bottom says, I, I picked out things that said single family homes, ADUs, apartments, duplexes, and so okay, that's, okay. Yeah, that's Right? Because I thought that they were relevant to increases in house capacity. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, remember, these are permits, these are not used. So, uh, so if, it, if you got a permit for a duplex, it's one as opposed to two, right? You know, I had no way to really kind of go out there. With subdivisions, I wasn't sure what it's been. Okay, so, but even if we, even if we take the numbers, the percentage increase in the housing unit, which you see 1.2, 1.9, 1.1, even if we double the numbers, right? That's still the way this. Right, don't want we see the you know population now, so right? So, so the other thing that it doesn't account for in any of this is I don't know how many of those are are short term rentals, right? They, it doesn't mean just because they built a single family home on the EU that it added to our long term housing stock, we could have been for short term rentals. We just don't know, okay? So, again. This that I put to you'll see I had another bullet point. I, we could go in a little bit deeper on this or, or you know, look at it a little closer. We feel like a plan list for some of the stuff, you know. But in general, it really appears that we saw a slowdown from 2010 to 2020, and we seem to have been a slowdown since since 2020, which again, everybody will tell you that we have you know, rising costs, lack of labor, you know, all, all of those issues. Okay. So you have a population that's growing, you have a supply that doesn't. So guess what the next thing is about? Pricing, right? So this slide, and just look at the graph on the left-hand side. That line that is at the top and going up dramatically, that's what it is. And the other two lines at the bottom are the state and the county, which actually track fairly closely. So, you know, the average home price here has increased 73%. Compared to 38 percent, we're not Now, you, and you can see in general the gap between us and Vermont as a whole is increased. Now, you, one reason you could say is, well, great, you know, we're building all these big houses on the Waterbury Center. Of course, the average price is going up. I mean, you know, I live on Maple Street. You know, my property was subdivided into three. We bought a farmhouse, two houses, 
behind this all for 800,000 and 1.1 million, right? You know, so in your new construction. So what we tried to do was actually look at a three-bedroom home as a good sense, because there's houses that are being built, right? So we kind of looked at, let's look at what's happened over the last couple of years, slow price of a three-bedroom home. We start looking at the MLS data. So now we're, we're really kind of getting, and Mike Bishop was able to get me the MLS data for 2000, um, 20, so for the last four years. And you can kind of see what, is happening that prices are going up. The average price is 450, 457. But the average price, which is actually the, sorry, not the average price, the median price, which is actually also the median price for a three bedroom home. And more importantly, if, if you look at this last year, the median price for a three bedroom home on what you're saying is $536,000, right? If you were leaving two term of coverage, Right, you could afford a home for hundred. So there's about a hundred thousand dollars for the ability to get in, right now. You know, in, in here. So, okay, any questions on that? But the, those those two slides, when I'm looking at tenants, the lack of growth, and then looking at this MLS data, and some of it is the property transfer data, really kind of gives an order to the thinking and story change. Unfortunately, what I don't have is a really good handle on the rents, but I can show you some information. I can show you some data on rents. On the rents. Okay. So, um, I'm sorry, the bottom line there, the 457, that's an average across uh, the median, flat, median sale price. Median sale price across four years. four years. But then, you know, the, the current situation uh, yeah. with the uh, 23 coming in at 520. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah. they indicate that that average doesn't uh, really address the current reality. Right, yeah. I mean, yeah, you look at the, just the jump from 2022 to 2023. Right. What's the median income again for a household? So a median income is about $100,000. For the household? For the household, yeah. yeah. I, for the household, right. I failed to see I'm, I'm, I'm not, I failed to see how hundred thousand dollar household can afford a house in four fifty seven. I can show you so there's a calculator that house him be no I, I mean I'm just I can show you just look on top of my plate. Yeah. You know, mortgage and taxes you're well over three grand a month for that house. Right. Um, that's if you put your twenty percent down. Um, I don't know. I just, no, I can't, not, I can't imagine. They look at me yeah, myself. Again, I'm looking at the state, state affordability calculator for that time, right? So, you know, because they're using current kind of insurance rates, they're using current kind of utilities, they're using current, kind of, you know, but yeah, and it's probably going to be Are they using 30% as an affordability index? Well, in general, when we talk about, when we come to the next slide and I talk about affordability, I'll be talking about 30%. Okay. 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 You're correcting for three bedrooms. What's your best guess if you started correcting also for square footage? I guess the question is, are we overstating the median price when we think of 2022 and 2023 with very large houses, three bedroom being sold? In other words, do we make the problem worse? I don't think that these three, most of the three bedrooms, 90 some percent of the three bedrooms are sold for existing ones, they weren't in the right? So right. it's always hard to tell the square footage. But you know, yeah. if you know, if you have to have this last three, you have to come to it. Right. But I just thought that if you were talking about an average you know, couple looking to buy, an average household looking to buy, in Waterbury, it's the better than so it's kind of a good thing to look at. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why I understand that. Yeah, median prices are being skewed by a very small number of very large three bedroom homes being sold up on the hills. Well, median would average would be would be affected by that median, right? Not so much, Okay, so let's talk about affordability. So the median, so household income for renters is just over 50 billion, right? But only 42% of the rentals 
that are available are affordable to them. So that leads you to the next slide. That almost nine, or say ninety percent of the renter-occupied households that are making less than fifty-two thousand are cost burden. As Mike said, that cost burden here means there's anything more than thirty percent of the renters. Okay. So that's one thing to that. The other thing that's actually interesting is you have about a hundred households that are making more than seventy-five thousand, right? And they're spending less than twenty percent, less than twenty percent of their housing costs, right? Now I'm not here to say that everyone needs to buy a house in order to live the American dream, right? Some people are happy and that's fine for them, right? But what I am to say, if you look at those people, if they did want to buy a house. They couldn't really afford to buy a house in Waterbury. Only 12 houses that sold in the last four years would be affordable to sell them. Hey, may, may I interrupt you for a second? Um, I just wanted to make a, almost the same point. Uh, and I'm going to use Ian as an example. Sorry. Um, if, you know, Ian being a professional in his field, I'm a professional in my field, both our fields pay historically. Love. <laughs> uh, and if we are making the above, you know, 52,000 to 60,000 range and renting, and we're paying more than 30% of our income to rent, there is no way, on, no possible way that we could afford even the average on the slide above it for a house stuck in this cycle of renting because you can't afford to save to buy the house as the cost of the house goes up and the cost of your rent goes up. And I think that that number, the first paragraph on affordability says that in one sentence, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Usually the way that the housing market has worked in the United States is that Young people let them room, they rent, they save enough money, they buy a house. They can three bedroom, small house, they eventually upgrade, they get older, kids leave, they downsize, they need to go back to rental, right? But in general, what we're seeing across the country is that breaking. Sometimes it's breaking for social reasons. People just don't want to buy, you know, or they don't want to downsize. But uh, for, what we're really seeing is breaking for economic reasons. <clears throat> People are in a house and can't necessarily afford to upgrade where they have upgraded, but they can't afford to downside because there's no for them to go. Right? So, if that freezes the overall market, and if you can start to look at the data here, that will tell you that that story is happening. Okay. So, the right hand side, just real quick, I wanted to, um, when we talk about affordability, and as Kim pointed out, we can talk about it from a renter perspective, but we have to think about it from an owner occupied perspective. So, about a quarter of the owner occupied houses here are cost burden. Uh -huh. And what cost I'm sorry. are cost burden. Cost burden. Yeah. Sorry, I just that right. Um, and then the, ne the next two get into looking a little bit specifically at some of the older residents. So, how, you know, that 17% of total rent renters and 81% of, of um, 81, 92 renter households are holding this 65 and they're cost burden, right? They're, all, they're already cost burden, they're cost burden. And this is really important because as you know, older people don't usually have any way of increasing their income along with this. So as their costs go up, more of them want to small and cost burden. And then the same thing happens, you know, owners older than 65 represent 20% and, you know, including 180. So the same thing with the whole cost burden is on, on we're seeing that on the owner occupied side too, right? Um, and it's important to keep that in mind because as we go forward and start talking about housing transfers, I mean, one of the things, the housing task force has not discussed this. We sidestepped this question a number of times. I'm not sure it's, it's actually our place to discuss it. But when we talk about more housing, we need to talk about more housing for people. Okay. You know, that's really important, and especially as, you know, if we have a cost fund, we start to put the program together. And there's a, a wide variety of opinions here, you know, but I think it, it is important that we, we at some point define. So summer, if I can just show some down the next slide, just to kind of summarize this in a couple of bullet points. 
So as of 2020, our population and median growth are out of the county and state, although our household growth is on par with the state as a whole. The addition of new housing units as of 2020 um, is on par with, with our growth in populations. If one of them is 5%, one of them is 6%, you know, 7%, they're all right around the same as of 2020. How since 2020, the growth rate of the housing supply lags demand by population housing growth. And that is especially when you consider that since 2020, we've had 90 more units, so 100 million in total, be short term rentals. They're coming from somewhere, right? You know, so um, when you consider that, that you can put more of a, of a strain on the housing supply is not growing as fast as even the permanent dollars are growing. Um, the home prices in Waterbury have increased at double the rate of Vermont as a whole. We had about 100K affordability gap for a two owner household to afford a three to here. And then half the renters and 25% of the owner occupied households are, um, are, are cost burden, and a significant portion of those are litigious. But that's our update. Joe, uh, what this is all saying to me is we're seeing a huge growth in, I don't want to say upper income, but more affluent people right. that can afford this community. And the workers of our our town are probably having to seek housing in outlying communities because they can't afford to live here, which is a shame. But I don't have a quick and easy solution for that, but that's what the numbers to me are, to me are saying. And without throwing a ton of money in, you know, I don't know how to rectify that problem to really house people. I, I know I saw some of your sol solutions in your housing trust fund recommendations are going to maybe meet a little bit of that, but I don't know how much it's, it, it, will, it will meet. You know, I don't know where we're going to go just because the, the increases. We're probably lucky that Waterbury is such a popular town, but in terms of costs, it's not really helping folks, you know, that, that are already living here. You know, a lot of people who come from out of state, they, they sell a house in New Jersey or, you know, Connecticut, and they sell it for, you know, $1.5 million, and they come here and pay cash for, for a nice house. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's part of the problem. Yeah, but that was the justification for 51 South Name. Right, right. And I think the other thing that we see is that the builders, for very good economic reasons, are building at the upper end of the market, right? Yeah. Because that's where the market is. You know, yeah. It's just so hard to make money at the time. It's not on the lower end because of labor costs, because of supply costs, because of. And, and, the problem, problem. and the problem is, in terms of demand, I hate to say it, is that no one wants a 24 by 40 ranch anymore. They, 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 they think that's terrible. I do. I want that. <laughs> but there are a lot of people we have created this whole McMansion, you know, society, and people poo poo a, a, a little rant. I remember when I started in lending, that's what was what we lent, lent on. And a lot of people got started, and today they're probably in a lot better positions to move up the line. Yeah, yeah Chris. So I'm going to kind of tell me Mike's comments. Mike, can you come, Chris, will you come up here just so the owl can hear you better, please? Yeah. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of tentacles that come with why this problem is what it is and it isn't just from a you know a housing perspective and waterbury being the place to come to now it's policies at the state house that it's putting more and more burden on people's pocketbooks um my concern with this housing trust is that <laughs> i know our goal is to help people acquire homes or or get into apartments and whatnot but I want to make sure that we don't 
continue to burden the ones that are already struggling. That's just ultimately going to push them out because I don't think you're you're defeating your purpose. You're, you're destroying the, the ones that you think you're trying to help uh, and shutting them out. Now, a lot of the construction projects that I'm on these days, I'm seeing, even though they're much bigger homes than uh, back when I had my Shaw Mansion development, I tried to get people to build smaller homes for a couple of reasons. I didn't want it over, uh, overwhelming the landscape. Um, the affordability issue was huge. In fact, one of my friends who was a contractor, I kept warning him not to build too big. He ultimately did. And I know of two or three people that built in that development that priced themselves out. They ultimately, over a period of 10 years or so, the taxes just overwhelmed them to the point that they said they can't do this, do this anymore, and they had to leave. Um, and I tried to warn them ahead of time, you know, and they had children that were just about ready to end high school, and why would you build a, a three-story house, including the finished-off basement, when your kids are going to be leaving, you're going to be empty nesters, put your kids in the basement like I did, and have one floor that... I built for myself where I knew someday I'd be too old to get up and down the stairs. So I, everything I built was on one floor. And from a tax perspective, your basement's always taxed cheaper uh, as a living. And if you could turn it into living space, it's always taxed cheaper in the long run. So when my kids left the house, I had an empty basement instead of an empty upstairs and everything I required was still on the main floor. Um, so I understand that, you know, we have additional revenue coming into the town. We just need to really be cognizant of the fact that not to inflict more damage on the people who are already struggling here, you know, to try to get people that are coming here in, in, in a place at the, at the expense of those that are super trying to get to stay here. You know, that's, that's one of my huge concerns. And Chris, just a question. Um, how do you see that uh, creating more ADUs, for example, is going to adversely impact people that are? No, uh, a lot of the, and that's, I, I finished, forgot to finish my comment there. A lot of the bigger projects that I'm seeing right now are, you know, the three bedrooms are, most of the engineers are designing four or five bedroom septic systems. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these new houses are coming equipped with an ADU mm -hmm. or okay. another law apartment or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So they're renting, I see it all the time. They're renting these the, the, you know, right. either through Airbnbs or whatever. That's how they're subsidizing, to your point, Tom, of how somebody at $100,000 making it. Well, in this case, they're they're having subsidized uh, renters in there. That that's putting them over the threshold of being able to afford it. Okay, thanks, Ken. Um, I just wanted to speak to, I guess, was to your point, Roger, was how would ADUs punish the people who are trying to help? And I just assumed you were mentioning the local option tax when you said punishing the people you're trying to help. Um, I got a text today that our restaurant just hit a record-breaking weekend. It's all tourist dollars. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no amount of locals that could give every restaurant in town a record-breaking weekend at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's all tourist dollars. And with that being said, I think you know going, going to the bar and paying your extra 1% for your beer or paying one, extra 1% for your cup of coffee, you don't notice it on a day-to-day -day basis, but as soon as we have the hordes of tourists that come in and spend the amount of money that they're spending, and we are taking some of that in the form of a local option tax, nobody, especially at the water grade level, 50% of renters that are underwater when it comes to their bills, um, are going to feel punished if we roll out incentives for landowners to build more uh, housing units. Can I present the trust fund piece? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I ask a quick question? Sure, sure. I think I saw it. What is the rent? What is this target rent that that is perfect for Waterbury? Is that part of the data collection? So I heard you say you don't know what rents are, but. Does it exist? I will, I will give a number 
but and when I present the trust fund. Oh, okay. and I'll tell you what that I'll tell you what that looks like a hundred forty percent. I don't know if that's the perfect number, but I haven't necessarily sat down, Karen, and thought through the fifty-two million know, thousand and that I'm proposing the calculation real quick and say if this is that number, does that equal thirty percent? We should figure that out. But I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Real quick, before we get to the other adjustment, could you share this data yeah. with us? Oh, guys, I, I, he sent it to me to share tonight. I can forward yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Thank minutes. you so much. Yeah, the other, the elephant in in the room. I agree with everything. I agree with what Kane says. I think the options taxes goods bring in some money, but we can't, you know, this is something out of our control where if we keep on increasing our property taxes through the state education fund by 14% a year, that's just going to, these numbers are just going to keep on inflating and keep on making it unaffordable for Kane to get his 24 by 40 ranch. <laughs> It, no, it, it, it's it's a reality, and just the affordability, and you know that we have to get a handle on factors that are we can't control here, and something's going to have to happen because these numbers are just going to get worse. So people aren't going to be able to afford homes. People who are in homes are going to have trouble, you know, continuing to be in their home and get a run for school board. <laughs> they would hate me. <laughs> what goes into the housing? Oh, sorry. That's all right. What, what goes into the housing cost component when we're measuring it? Um, affordability? In, yeah. Is it mortgage? Is it maintaining your house? No. Is it insurance? What, what are the components of housing? And owner? It is your mortgage, it is your property taxes, it is your insurance, and it is your utilities. And you want utilities. Okay, so a renter is your, um, is your rent, and then if you pay the utilities, it's your utilities. Right. No maintenance involved in that? Because no maintenance. No, yeah. yeah. That's the yeah. good point. And most lenders don't have this. It's why you're going to show it. Yeah. 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 Most, most lenders are looking at just mortgage taxes and insurance. Okay, Joe has asked if he can do his presentation. Okay, so, so the housing trust fund. Um, we have a recommendation for that. Um, where it should be targeted, we have how it should be targeted. Uh, in some, at least to start on some programs. We don't have all the programs, and that's because we need a little Okay, so when we, we've been talking about Developed now for a while, and then at the task force, right? And as I, we've got to learn more about this. I think I, I tend to think about it in these three categories. There is, you know, individual homeowners and landlords that are doing small development of one to four units. I mean, these are usually people. I mean, and I mean, carry your example, right? They develop, you know, they're coming in a little bit house, but they're not looking to sell that. They're actually looking to rent that and become landlords. They're in, you know, and lands and are not and either half or not. Yes, of course, so exactly into that category. Ooh. Then we have smaller scale developers that are doing maybe five to 20 units, but you know, they're looking at developing something, but not only as long as they're looking at selling, right? And if you sold to people who want to rent it, if you sold people to buy it. Then you have the 20 plus units who are kind of the really big kind of statewide developers. So our first thought, our first recommendation is that the housing trust fund should really be targeting the individual homeowners and landlords who we talked about here are looking to maybe add an ADU, give them some supplemental income and, and, and things like that. And we're going to talk about some programs around the state that are there. Okay. okay. Next slide, Tom. So I call this existing trust fund programs. It's existing programs, not necessarily all trust fund programs. Uh, so in general, trust funds, though, these programs have had two goals. They're either focused at affordable rentals or they're focused at home ownership. And if you remember, Tom had Angie from Downstream presented to the select board a couple of months back. And Angie really kind of cautioned us on trying to tackle the home ownership problem. And the reason is, is because with the housing prices and with the mortgage rates, it's just really expensive. And uh, you can have a lot of money and a really little impact. And just to give you an idea, I went out and I took you know, three programs that are out there now, and I calculated how much we would have to have per household. So you can see that ranges from $73,000 to $92,000. Right? 
um, in order to do something on the home ownership side. So our recommendation is don't do that. <laughs> um, is actually instead spend the money focus more around affordable rentals. Okay, and I give a number of examples of programs here. I did want to go, Tom, to the next slide, if you would, and just go into detail on, on two programs. So one is the VHIP program, and you know this was actually funded by the state, I believe it was funded by using federal dollars, now it's being funded actually through state dollars. And they had a pretty interesting record, and it's I mean, your critique recipient, right? Um, you know, they, they're investing in, you know, they're, they're investing in bringing housing capacity. It could be a new build or it could be a rehabilitation of existing buildings, but bringing housing impact, uh, bringing house, new housing capacity on the market. They've helped to restore or build almost a thousand units already, and their average investment has been just over 38,000 per month in order to bring that capacity on. Now, they do have requirements for uh, people who accept this money and that they need to sign a covenant agreeing to charge at, at or below the HUD fair market rate, okay? So the HUD fair market rate, as far as I understand, is, you know, the 40, is 40% 40 of the average or median rental for the county. And that is approximately 1,100. So Karen, that's about the best number that I've got you get, right? Um, and, and again, is, are you saying that 1100 is the median or 1100 is the target? 1100 is the target. Not the median. No, it's not the median. Yeah. 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 I think it's saying that's the rent. Yeah. Yeah, but right. it's target rent. It's yeah. Target rent. Through VHIP, that has to include all your utilities and everything. That's yeah. rent. Yeah, that's rent. Right. right. <laughs> For one bedroom. For one bedroom, so it's twenty-two for a two-bedroom. Uh, no, no, not that easily. <laughs> <laughs> not entirely. Probably not fifteen. Okay. So, okay, so that gives you. So that's the company you have to sign, and then if you decide to go with a five-year term, then tenant selection needs to be done by an organization such as Downstreet. So that's one of the things that when Downstreet talked about managing, one of the things that they do. Is for VHIP recipients in Washington County is the tenant selection for them. If you go with a longer term, 10 year, you can do your own. Okay. Another program I looked at was Woodstock has at least a local program. And this is not necessarily to bring on new housing capacity. I think their main objective here is to convert the short term rentals to long term. This is a new program that just started this year. Um, I, you know, I don't have a good feeling. Mean, we don't know yet how successful it will be, but the property owner signed a seasonal or long-term lease with a household containing an adult employee or will be employed in the, in the, in the town, okay? And for that, they get $3,000 for the first year and then nothing past that. Well, again, I don't know if economically that makes sense. You have to get a little bit of time to see but in general, it just gives you a flavor of how some of the other towns are trying to approach the issue that Mike yeah. was talking about. Do you know how many have taken them up on it? So I do know they, I can tell you that I did talk to them. They had inquiries, but they haven't signed it. Okay. But I think they just started with the net. So, you know. And when, yeah. when I spoke to them, they were rolling out. Yeah. They were like, we just started this it, program. We're really excited about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I got no data. There was no data because nothing had happened yet. I mean, well, and still maybe. Yeah, and we'll check in. You probably okay. didn't ask them what they're doing, right? You know, but I'm just saying it's an example. Of this. Now, is, is there any length of time that the landlord has to commit to maintaining that as a rental unit <laughs> under those stipulations? On the lease to locals program? Right. So they can just do it for one year and, get, and they're, yeah. they're done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Does Woodstock have the whole fund or like do they have an infinite? No, they have 60,000 in funding. Yeah. And that 3,000, again, they scale that by the size of the apartment. I think that might be for a two or three bedroom and there's less for one bedroom. I know, but yeah, so it, it's, it's scaled. Yeah. Yeah. Is it $3,000 a year or is yeah, it one time? One time. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I made the answer one year. I got it. 
Yeah, I have so many thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said, I think on the program side, what the housing task force is doing is they're, is they're trying to understand the existing programs. What are other towns doing? What makes sense? Mm -hmm. What is just throwing stuff at the wall? <laughs> and like where in, in the case of VHIP can we actually show some traction? Okay. And what other already exists, I guess, would be in one other, right? Like the downstream shared equity, someone in Waterbury theoretically could access. Just, I know, Mike, you were big yeah. about not yeah. replicating programs. So I just wanted to note some of those, like they have those. in theory, you could apply. It would require finding a home of a certain value that no one else had quickly purchased, so I'm not saying I think it's feasible, <laughs> but in theory, they're serving our area. The shared equity one of the last yeah. one. So the question was asked, how much, right? So the one way, there's a number of ways to think about it. So one of the ways to think about it is like the real price of 38,000 per unit, right? Yeah. Would be so how many units do you want? Just multiply that out, and that would be a long The other way is to start, and because it was the request was for the conversation was funding that from the local option tax company, right? So, what we did was to look at what is the theoretical contribution of the local of, of short term rentals to the local option tax over a 12 month period. Now, this data comes from housingdata.org, they get it from a company called AirDNA. Who gets it directly and indirectly through Airbnb and VRB? Some of it is screen scraping, some of it is they actually have agreements with property manager who provide the data. Okay. Did a little bit of background checking just to see what their, you know, there are, they say it's about 90 to 95% accurate, but usually when they say that, they're talking about a larger area than just the town, like whatever, maybe for the county, maybe for the state. So that take that with this. Take that as it is, okay, you know? But in general, what we see here are the number of active short-term rental. It shouldn't say home, it should say units, actually. Yeah. Right? Over the past 12 months. And then what was the average monthly revenue? And then what would 1% of that be? And you see the number comes out to 93,000. Okay? So, um, is this the slide that Mary Ellen questioned you about? This is the slide that Penn questioned. Yes. Yeah, what, and what was her? Penn says that she believes the average monthly rent is for home is too high. It's too high. Yeah. Based on her. Right. Based on her, actually, not based on her rentals. Right. Right. She, right. Sure. I don't sure. She's Penn Lamsey. My question she said that she believes the average monthly revenue for home is too high based on her rent. But her rentals are. Just for some content, I was a part of an email thread that I have no business right. being on. Yeah. <laughs> I read that, right. and so I'm asking Joe for a little more information about the background of it. And that's what made me go back and do the data check to say, what, how did he get the data? What's the percent accuracy they are talking about? Uh -huh. right? you know, so. but, but Mary Ellen Lampson, who had short-term rentals in Waterbury, stated that she felt 5060 per month was too high. It's too high. Okay. Right. Again, but it, you also you look at the variety. I mean, she had, I'm not sure what her units are here. I mean, I know on the Maple Street, she has two plants and she rents out there for this group. That's the only one I know of that short term. She may have other short terms. I don't know. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But I mean, we're talking about houses back in order of the center yeah. that rent down. Ah, uh, right. I see your point. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, that that was, is too high. Like, that's, right. you know, I mean, yeah, certainly if you're talking about a duplex, you kind of like need to you. Yeah. yeah. But if you're talking about some of the well, back in the center, that's going to pull that money. Understood. Okay. And, and one one person's lived experience versus the entirety of the data from the town, right? I would trust the data, I think, a lot more. But it speaks maybe in, in, in some small way, it speaks to like, all right, compare me to Mary Ellen Lips and I have two bedroom apartments, just like she has a two bedroom Airbnb. Um, so is that your target opposed to the big house on the hill that obviously could profit off an Airbnb in a way that and they couldn't profit off it. But we're not trying to target anyone here, right? All, all that we're saying is that we believe that the short-term rentals in Waterbury 
you know, generating so much revenue, and one percent of that should be paid to the local option tax, and that's going to be about ninety thousand dollars. Um, question for Tom, when we get the actual LOT numbers from the state, does it break down by the four categories of rooms, meals, sales, That's what I believe. alcohol? So also just to name, we didn't discuss this in the meeting, but we would have a definitive after the fact metric, not just of short term rentals, also of hotels and anyone charged for a room tax. We'll have that data when we get the money. <laughs> so just to say that will be another interesting check. Obviously, it'll be a lot. I was just thinking of like what definitive data might we have. Um, and the registry should give us a sense of whether the left hand copy is cool. Yeah, yeah. 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 really important. Yeah. 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 And Tom, you said that uh, you're expecting the first uh, tranche of uh, LOT money to arrive in November? In November, yeah. Okay. But that's so that's one way to look at, at the number, right? The other thing you could also take how many units you want and multiply by 30,000. The other way is you just looked at what are some other towns doing. So Montpelier, for example, they allocate 110,000. Um, this is actually just from their budget, and they do that as a penny on uh, per 100,000 assessed value. That's how they fund theirs. It's actually plus the path to be to 110,000. They're a little bit bigger than us, right? Not that much, but a little bit. Woodstock, smaller than us, they fund this lease to locals and other programs with 60,000. Um, Williston is actually funding their trust fund through a tax on developers who um, build without allocating a certain percentage of affordable units. They don't have any numbers yet on that because they just started doing that, right? So, there's, again, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. We went with the local option tax because that was the discussion that the select board was having and said, well, what would you do? How would you allocate that? Does Wilson have a tax for free and all developing? That's all developers that are not building affordable, or is it above a certain dollar threshold only? I don't know for sure. Yeah, I mean, because it, it, it just, you know, just started too, but yeah. But I didn't know that it was they were looking for a certain allocation. And that's just for new construction. Yes. Again, different maybe that's different in the number we get any So our recommendation, finally. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay. Can I do a question? Yeah. Okay. So our current uh, no office tax revenue stream cool short term renewals at this point. Yeah. Have you heard any opinions from the I forget what it's called, the short term yeah. rental alliance on this type of proposal? Well, it's not Going, I mean, we're not taxing short term rents. Right. Well, just what we're, what we're saying is that they're being taxed already. But right. we're saying what we're trying to estimate is what percent of the local option oh, is from that. And then, hey, wouldn't that be great if we can put that into four right. That's all we're doing. We're not trying to tax anyone more. Okay. Yeah, we understand the point about the cost for it. So, our recommendation is to, first of all, I mentioned this before, <laughs> we should really have, I think as a town, we should have an objective. For how much we want to expand our town's rental supply um, with affordable options. And the recommendation is to say a half to a percent, that would be 48 units. You might say that's not enough, it needs to be more than that, but it kind of gives you at least the target of then, you know, here's what we want to do, and here's how much money we need to do it. So um, the recommendation here is based on. A half to a percent because we believe that the number that we're recommending it, it support that. By affordable options, we mean rents out or below the HUD fair market value rate. And that's consistent with the region. Okay, we're not, you know, one of the things we had an open forum at our last house task force meeting. One of the things that really surprised me was how we talk over each other with things, even with the definition of what's a need and, and what's affordable. And, you know, everyone has different definitions. And what I took away from the people that were there is to completely confused by this, right? Um, so I would say that if we're going to take a stab at affordability, let's define it as it's already defined, and, you know, and work with that, okay? Um, the other recommendations that 
through the programs. I mean, we are assuming that there will be more demand and supply for these programs if we do this right. And that we should look at prioritizing leases to households that are employed by an employer located in town or operating a business that's based in town. So as a way of what's been known as including what's called the workforce house, okay? Um, that the housing trust fund should be funded through the local option tax in an annual amount of 100% of a local option tax contribution from short-term rentals. It's the last slide, I guess. We, we say that that's one way. We can do that, we can track that, we can track it every quarter because the state gives us the data and we would know how much that should be going to the trust fund. That then we are also recommending that the trust fund be created as either a 501c3 or that we leverage an existing 501c3 to house the fund and that we look for matching contributions to either grants or philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And other, I've seen examples of other towns that are doing this, especially they're applying for grants. You're seeing the towns putting in the first chunk of money. We're looking at matching that, or they're actually going out. There's um, down in the W counties in the southeast part of the state. <laughs> the Windsor. Right. Windsor. Yeah, Windsor and Windsor, right. They are actually raising private money also towards mm -hmm. their housing trust funds. I would actually start with the larger employers in the county on this, okay? And then that specific program recommendations and the limits would be presented when the funding is finalized. I mean, we still have a little more work to do and understand what programs are there and how successful they are. And again, you know, $50,000 and $200,000 is a big difference in terms of how we spend the money. So once we have that, it will come back to specific program recommendations. Okay. Um, and have you uh, reached out to uh, Downstreet about whether they would be interested in uh, uh, housing the Waterbury Housing Trust Fund? Uh, no. or so I reached out to RW and I asked Julie if they would, since housing is in their charter, mm -hmm. if they would house, if they would be the 501c3 that could house the trust fund. Mm -hmm. And then with them in order to generate the matching contributions. Okay. I think downstream has a role, as Tom has talked about, in terms of, like, again, that's going to be more developed depending on the programs that we have. Yeah. You know, we don't want to be deciding who to give the money out to, right? You know, then they bring downstream in to, to do that. Uh -huh. RW, Julie said that she would be open to it and open to presenting it to the board. So I mean, it's just efforts and I think. We, when we spoke, <laughs> whatever meeting that was a few months ago to Downstreet, mm -hmm. they had expressed, um, interest isn't the right word for it, but they had expressed uh, a feeling that it would be relatively easy for them to slide into us funding this program through them as they already do it through, with Montelier. Right? Mm -hmm. And so loading up the fund is the easy part. And I think even handing it, handing control to a 501c3 is also an easy part because they already have the mechanisms, especially downstream, already has the mechanisms in place to roll out. If we just said, we want an ADU program, we want to assist to be hip in their ADU program, um, downstream had expressed that that would just, we they said, we already do it in Montpelier, we can do it here. Right, but we don't have specific right. answer from them. Right. Okay. I agree with Kane. Um, I think, Downstreet has the expertise. I think there would, there would be a, a, a decent amount of learning curve for RW to take up. The housing world is a very specific world. And having an organization that already does this, I think, has a lot of value added. But let me clarify, because I think there's two things here that were intermingled. There is the part where you, you fund the funds. And then you're looking at a 501c3 who is taking that contribution, which they may be doubling it, right? right. Which is fundraising. Mm -hmm. And then you have the administration with getting out of the money, right? I mean, downstream, yeah, our W has no experience in getting out of the money. Right. You're right. right. So downstream would be a great partner in terms of selecting. Running the whole process to apply for apply for the funds, who gets to be selected, who gets the money, all of that activity downstream. 
In terms of raising the additional funds, I think either one of them, we have to kind of look at the pros and cons. I mean, downstream's done it through grants, but we, I mean, they're busy doing it for themselves. We go for us, RW, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, RW is focused more on water. RW is focused more on Waterbury and right. it might be a better partner in terms of trying to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mike. Oh. Throw, throw the elephant in the room. I know you, you kind of uh, downplayed a little bit owner-occupied housing or some sort of owner-occupied. I know it's difficult and it's expensive, but in your deliberations, other than cost, did you see any mechanism? I'm a strong believer that Home ownership is one of the cornerstones of the American dream. Mm -hmm. uh, getting someone into a house, you know, perpetual rental. Some people love it, but I, you ask, probably fifty to seventy-five percent of renters, they would love to own their own house, you know, mm -hmm. versus being a renter. So I don't know. Was there any thought of what would the cost be to have some sort of a rental program? Can we? like partner with someone like Downstreet who does the HUD home program, which, could, you know, we already do on uh, Meadowwood. You know, we have, we have units up there, do it somewhere else in Waterbury, something similar to that. So I'm going to, so what I'm going to say next is not the opinion of the task force, it's my personal opinion. Okay. okay. So I'm just, um, I the one area the, the one group that I think is really promising and I talked to Tom about this a little bit is I really think that you should look at establishing habitat for humanity because they have a fairly good program that they want to get started here in Waterbury. They're already doing it in Washington County. Right. They are targeted at exactly what you said, Mike, at home ownership uh, for people who need the help. They have done some really amazing work in how to reduce supply costs and their labor costs are volunteers. Right, know. it's like but they also have right. a finance piece where they're able to come in and help people. And I do know that I don't understand the details one hundred percent, but up in Greensboro, for example, they've actually outsourced some of that. They're actually using part of Habitat to increase home ownership, but not actually through Habitat. So Habitat's actually doing an administration. I didn't quite understand from Zach exactly what they're doing. Habitat may fund the money but and stuff like Habitat that. Habitat might be doing the selection and the final right. piece for that, right? Yes, you know. But I would say that, you know, Zach is looking at getting a birth property here to get established. And I think that if they were able to get some momentum, and what we've seen from this community and the involvement of this community around flood recovery and things like that, I think it's a way that you could be putting a couple, I mean, they'll do duplexes, or you could be a couple of duplexes on the market. Right. That is a start. Okay, thank you. Um, not as a counterpoint to you, Mike, but to expand on what you're talking about. I do believe, as a renter myself and as someone who is, surrounded mostly by renters. Most people in the industry that I work in are renters unless you own the business, in which case you might still be a renter. Um, is that if rent is even brought into the, the orb of more affordable, even if it's you know a few hundred dollars a month or even less than that, it gives us an opportunity to save money to eventually buy a house. Whereas right now we're stuck in this cycle of, right. of just keeping our heads out of the water. And, and to move on that point, I think handing over um, management to an organization like RW, which is already a 501c3 and is Waterbury focused is a great idea. And then the execution through um, downstream, also a great idea. If we can get both on board, um, I think this is gonna be pretty hitchless. Um, what I would recommend is that we fund, is that we put the money in the pot so that when these conversations take place, we have funding ready to go to the ground running. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, about funding this. So just looking at the numbers, um, 
93,000 from the LLG. Um, let's say we double that through grants and philanthropy, we get to 180 K. Are we, um, using the VHIP program as kind of our, our, our guiding light that we're thinking we would from that 180, we would reasonably invest 38,000 there. So per apartment, just thinking like that equates to what five ish. So we, are we a little that's low a, on our funding? Like that's a good way to think about it. I mean, that's the number that the state has over almost a thousand different ones. So I would say that's a good number to think about. I would, the one reason, the other reason we haven't quite, we're, uh, we're looking at programs is we're definitely, we're not so, we're not sure where the residents of Waterbury stand in being ready for, for this, right? And in fact, in the VHIP program, they put, they publish. So of that 964, I think there's only two residents. I don't want to. Two residents from Waterbury? That's right. And back, Tom, if you could put me in the country, because all the applications go through downstream here, I'd like to find out how many people we can apply. Right. Okay. And that's one of the concerns I wanted to raise is uh, VHIP is now a pretty mature program and it's not been around for a decade, a few years. So I feel like um, even if you add kind of money on top of it, I'm not sure at what point it spurs you to build an ADU or not. But it's all that, right? It's over the track. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Statewide. Yeah. Statewide, but I'm not sure about Waterbury. Um, <laughs> Yeah, one other concern I have, um, maybe this is John does because I started my career in this world when when every town, county, city seemed to have an economic development corporation. And the whole point they thought was, well, create this 501c3 and fundraise. And no one does anymore for a lot of good reasons. Um, I think generally is that you lose accountability over time if you've got someone aside from the people in this room administering the money and then you have higher administrative costs sometimes too so i'm you know again maybe it's just john to because of history but i'm a little weary of the idea of the town automatically sending 90 grand to a, a 501c3 to um you know to make these decisions i don't i don't necessarily view um investing in 40 units annually is something beyond the capability of, of the town with maybe some, some contractual help or staff help. But I feel like, um, I don't know, I just feel like it's a lot of money to sort of give out on an ongoing basis. Um, and then once you have that relationship with that 501c3, it's really hard to, it's really hard to pull that back. Once it's created, it's created and generally these things last a long, long time. And it's really hard to pull them back because even if they're marginally effective over time, they've got their own base of power and authority over time. So I just, I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm just saying, I think it's the biggest decision in this document by far is to consider a 501c3 far bigger than 90 grand a year. Can I ask a follow-up question? So the reason that we suggested a 501c3 was that for businesses that want to contribute to be taxed enough. I do know from a previous life that municipalities could also set something up for tax deductible contributions. Is that correct? Yeah. And that might be the way. I mean, that's what we were trying to accomplish. Yeah, and I think there is, there is certain, it, certainly yeah, an advantage right. there. Um, yeah. The other advantage I hear talked about all the time is, well, you know, 501c3s can apply for different grants in the towns. But I've been hearing that for 20 years, and I feel like I cannot say one tangible example where that's actually true. Right. Like every grant that comes out, if the town is notable, so are the 501c3s, we're all in the same pot. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, for fundraising, I think it'd be great to have a fundraising entity to match town funds, but I'm just leery of giving this out to a different entity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How quick can we even get this? I, from my understanding, is the IRS is becoming much more stingy with you know, giving 501c3 status because of the, there's so many of them out there. Has that been looked at in terms of? Mm -hmm. I, I tell you, again, I, I'll come back to the root of that. I, that's why I wanted to clarify. Yes, Tom. It was because we felt that if businesses 
could give on a tax deductible basis if they would be more willing to do it. Absolutely. If there's a way of accomplishing that directly with the fund in the town, I think that accomplishes the same. And did you talk to any businesses in Waterbury that would be interested, or do you have any examples of other? Approached them. Hmm? We have not yet approached them. Okay. No uh, examples of others. Yeah, that have leveraged yeah. leveraged uh, yeah. business funding. Yeah, yeah, they're leveraging private philanthropy, and I think some of it's coming from their businesses down there. Yes. Uh, which one was that? Um, the Windsor and the other W. Windsor, Windsor, Windsor. Yeah, right. Yes. <laughs> um, I was going to point out that yes, maybe some larger um, corporations would donate for a tax deductible basis, but a lot of them are brick and mortar. Uh, locally owned businesses feel like their contribution to the local option tax is enough. Um, and if we were to go farther than just including um, short-term rentals, local option tax um, in this number, and also included uh, local employers um, like forest stops, restaurants, bars, hotels um, in these figures and bump those numbers up, I, I think we wouldn't need to pursue as much fundraising as be, has been um, recommended. So it's easier to fundraise for housing than roads, I guess. <laughs> Better face, maybe. <laughs> much more tangible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions for Joe? Yeah. Well, it's a couple, and then you can tell me to shut up. <laughs> Um, first, I guess I'd ask, is the bonus, de the affordable option, is that also consistent with affordability definitions for the bonus densities? So that if there's new construction for this, would it match and would we get, uh, I think it's 20% of floor space and an extra, extra quote unquote story. I don't know what story is. Do you know if they match that as well? I guess it might from the planning commission. required by is that the actual no, that the actual is, story? Uh, the home. Yeah, the home. Yeah, but that's a state, right? It would be nice if it is. Yeah, it would be nice if it is, yeah, it nice if it is but given what we saw from our last meeting, it's, the state has several different definitions. I, we have to see if it, right. do they mean the high fair market? That yeah, fair market. I, know it, I know it's based on the fair market rate, right. and I'm afraid to say, I thought it was 110% for the affordable housing, but for the density, but I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. But it'd be a nice thing to yeah. sort of look at. Um, also, I know we want to look at it as the option local options tax, but that from the data you show that fluctuates quite a bit. So, if I had my wish as a taxpayer here, and not to sort of get the town out in front of its skis, what I'd like to see is kind of what I'd say is a retroactive funding, so that you use the money that was collected from the local options tax in 2023 to fund to determine how much you have in 2024. So you have the money in the bank already, and you know it rather than going in the red for it. And once the system goes, if you want to borrow from it, you borrow from it. But, but you do, do something like that. Um, I'd also be interested in making sure we, we have in place some uh, measurement of efficacy. How good is it working and ongoing need, right? We shouldn't in perpetuity need four to eight units, or we may decide rental's not the way to go. We need home ownership, or there might be a year where we get lucky and don't need it. So I would, I would really not want to make this a permanent, I think that's a little bit dovetailing off of what um, Tom said. Uh, um, I guess on 501c3, you guys do what you want. Um, Waterbury Land Initiative got their 501c3 status in a year, uh, actually in less than a year. So, but I think you could use somebody else in the interim. So I don't think it'd be a big deal if you want to move forward. And the last question, sorry, is, I would actually advocate that this be based somewhat on location. We wouldn't want to have a lot of new buildings up in places where we've decided we also want to conserve, right? We want to be in what we've now established as hopefully we'll establish more of a town policy. We want to grow rental units in places where people can walk, can shop, can live, and not necessarily up in the ridges and, and, and in the woods. I don't know that we want to encourage the building there. I guess that might be a bigger issue, but. I'd like us to see us focus on building up in the Waterbury Center, between Waterbury Center and the village, where, where you think is appropriate. So what we would have is we would have a zone that's legal. 
that would that would be something I would add and advocate so it's consistent with other policies. So thanks for letting me do that. Uh, I just want to go back to uh, reiterating that I think we should get at least the recommended funds in the pot so that when these conversations complete, we are ready to go. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you want to make a motion now or do you want to no. put it on the agenda for another time? I suppose I can make a motion now. No harm in it. I move to allocate $93,216 of the local option tax to the housing trust fund. Go ahead, Kevin. So, I think we can take this up uh, going forward. Uh, I think we got great new information uh, tonight, uh, and uh, we are looking to allocate funding to uh, the spending of the uh, local option tax for this year uh, by the end of the year, I think. Um, but, um, you know. What it, what's the right figure? I uh, also feel like, uh, to Tom's point and Billy's, uh, we don't necessarily need to box ourselves in saying that we are going to allocate a certain amount of money in perpetuity. Uh, I believe that what we have discussed with the local option taxes, that that will be a, a annual recommendation uh, that the town brings uh, to uh, either puts it in the budget uh, and or brings it to uh, the uh, voters on uh, town meeting day. So uh, my understanding of, of what our intention was originally. But, any other discussion on this? I agree with your comment, Director, 100%. And maybe I I like the idea that Kane's putting something out on the table, but I think something that's a little bit more based upon, you know, the options tax, and not not number-wise, that we, we can work with. Mm -hmm. well, I just want to say thing. thank you so much for an awesome presentation. All that data was yeah. hugely helpful. Thank you, Joe. Great. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. All right. So, what are we doing? He made a motion. Huh? I it's, uh, it didn't get second. It did no, not get second. Second, I guess. So. Though to be clear, I, don't remember, I think Kane's intent was not a perpetual motion. It was a, you didn't specify. You either, but uh, my understanding is you're making that motion for the 2023. Yeah. Um, no, that would be half a year. Or yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess that's my question. So, like, yeah, my clarity was, yeah, is. Was, yeah. I mean, as discussed in previous meetings, it was the the amount from this year, and then in perpetuity, it would need to be decided by the voters, not by the select board. Okay, because it would become a budget item. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I do think that we can, uh, well, we've got this recommendation. I think there are a couple of things that may, it can be ironed out a little bit more clearly about the relationship uh, of uh, where the fund stands in regard to RW versus the town versus uh, downstreet. Um, but I do think we'll get somewhere on this. Okay. Um, Clean Water uh, Advisory Committee member solicitation. This is from uh, the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. And then I'm looking for a municipal representative. Oh, we need to advertise for that. Yeah, yeah we don't have a um, anyone to uh, that is we don't have a candidate as of now. So, right? so um, pick your poison how you want to move forward with it. There's no obligation. Uh -huh. Right, you can have one yourselves. You can decide to advertise. It's the field. Well. 
anyone around the table uh, feel like participating in this? If not, I think we might want to advertise. I I might be might be interested, but I will give it some thought because I do have a real interest in water policy with all the between the Friends of Waterbury Reservoir, some of the yeah, anglers associations. Uh, but I don't want to only kind of go forward right right this second. <laughs> when are they looking? I'm just trying to read this. So. Uh, you, you attach the attached. You complete the attached application form and submit it by email um, before. I guess I'm sorry. Doesn't say. Uh, doesn't have a deadline. But that's, have that's why I said that. Uh, I didn't know if there was a deadline. The application the second April Thursday of the month in November. Right. We they said the meeting time. dates and stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. So I guess we don't have a particular deadline. If uh, Mike, you want to give us uh, some further I'll consideration. I also don't think we're limited to one. It says that, I mean, maybe they would never appoint two municipal representatives from the same community, but I would encourage us to advertise it for anyone yeah, that, I, who might I would, be interested. I would do. If someone in the community is really, I would bear to that to another person. Karen, is this okay to share and just note that it wouldn't go to you, it would go to this, like to put this on the town website? Put it on the town website, maybe put something just on the front posting. Or like you're both talking, so let me just clarify. Are you asking me if I would be willing to advertise the position and have applications go directly to the CB or PC? Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion on this topic? Do you want those applications to go directly to them? You don't want to vet them? I, I'm just asking. I don't have an opinion. I think we should probably bet. Them. Yeah. Why don't yeah. they come here and then we'll bet them and then we'll forward. I mean, you're going to get thirty. <laughs> we'll get thirty. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. But... Thirty. <laughs> really? People have that much free time. So. It took six months to staff the disaster. <laughs> 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 hmm. If we get three, I think. Okay. I'll have the. I'll have people interested. People contact me. And then I'll give them the application. So we can help you figure that out. Why don't we? Uh, can we ask them to? Would uh, two weeks be enough time? You suppose? So that we could bring this up at the next right. meeting. I think that's it. Well, sure, I can do a deadline of the Friday before and right. see where we're at. Sure. So. I will just. I don't think that's our role. It says we encourage you to share this application with municipal boards, committees, staff, and volunteers. And the regional planning commission has their own application. So right. personally, I don't feel like we need to bless who from our municipality moves for it. But if it's the board's pleasure, that's fine. I personally just don't think it's our role on this one particular. We appoint a waterbury representative. It's Doug Greason. He's our rep to CBRPC generally. But for this advisory committee, I think it goes out on every listserv they can find. So if if we're willing to have our website do that, I think it's great. But Excellent. again, I'm not I'm not gonna like pick a fight over it. I just I don't think it's an appropriate needed role for us on this. <laughs> like I said, I, I don't care either way. Um okay. Uh I don't know if we want to make more work for ourselves. Okay. So maybe we just put it out there and let them apply directly. And if they happen to be from Waterbury, so much the better. Okay. All right. Uh, Randall Street Halloween. Moving on to the one point on Oz. The. Do we have a proposal? No. There might have been an email. No. No, I don't know. Usually it's an agenda item. <laughs> well, what did he say? there must have been an email. I can imagine it may have come from the Smith household. Yes, the, the request was to still, was to close Randall Street from 4 to 9 p.m. on Halloween, which has been done for a long time. You're right. Do we not also and close it now? Didn't we do that last year? We yeah, closed that one as well. And yes, it'll start uh, somewhere after uh, the uh, Peer and Collective and Pro Pig parking lot. Yeah, right. And then uh, it'll also be closed at the other end at uh, Park Row. Uh, it has been done for several years in a row. It's not terribly controversial. Uh, Halloween will be on the 31st of October this year, I believe. I was living here the day of the week. <laughs> 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 you didn't <look> this year. <laughs> well, people have tried. 
to move it to the Saturday, but uh, that never happens. Uh, so, do I have a motion? I have a, I make a motion that we approve closing Elm and Randall Street from the, uh, the Pearl Pig parking lot down to Park Row for Halloween Eve. Uh, no. No, Halloween night. No. Halloween night. Halloween, Halloween night. Eve. It's got a whole different theme. <laughs> <Right. laughs> Well, should we put hours from four to twenty nine? Nine. Seems reasonable. Okay. Uh, is there any specific? I mean, you know this. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Mm -hmm. um, specific directions for public works that they're responsible for doing. When we say we're closing it, can can we be specific what we're asking public works to do? Yes. Uh, put up a barricade and a sign there. And maybe some warning that uh, the road will be closed. And some of those big animatronics from uh, Spirit Halloween—they'll—they'll <laughs> they'll be out there. They'll do plenty of it. Yeah. Okay. I just okay. wanted to put that in there as well. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, any further discussion on this one? Hearing none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? They have stations. All right, Randall and Elm Streets have their road closed on Halloween night. Any related PSAs about dropping off candy for those homes? Oh, right. Um, there will be a collection box in the library for collecting uh, candy to be redistributed to the households on those two streets. Uh, and I think uh, often on the book side, they do the same. So uh, deadline for that. There is no deadline. You can bring stuff up until uh, seven o'clock on Halloween night. But uh, just drop off my office and make sure it gets finished. <laughs> <laughs> and watch our town manager blow up. We'll have, to have a wellness program. <laughs> yeah, um, we'll get more detail on uh, who's. Uh, organizing the collection, uh, but there are usually a couple of different places in town uh, that uh, take donations of candy to, uh, I think last year it was about 800 kids. Of course, many of those were repeat uh, customers. Only so much policing can be done. Um, I'll see if the Rotary can make a oh, donation. Yeah, for candy. Be great. Thank you. Um, swimming pool, quote. Received a quote. Tom, do you want to talk us through this a little bit? Sure. So the pool is bedeviled us for longer than I've been here. Um, 2023, um, despite the despite the rain, we've had a huge amount of water loss. Um, so the um, Pool is a little over 500,000 gallons. So in 2023, we effectively turned over the pool one and a half times, just keeping up with water loss. Um, that spring before the pool opened, um, the water department staff actually did a lot of work on the drain, and that was perceived as having a challenge before, and that was fixed, we think. Um, pool is lowered in the winter. Some water is kept in it to protect the, the concrete from the cold, but it's lowered in the winter and, and it doesn't go below that point. So we, we can theorize the skimmer system, which runs around the whole outside of the pool, the water into the collection box into the filter building. Theorize that that doesn't have any substantial leaks or we run dry. Um, so the the old story is the, the the fiberglass coating put in decades ago essentially failed immediately. So there are these big bubbles, particularly in the shallow end. Um, last year, they tried a new approach. They actually went and, and cut the bubbles open in spots and, and applied some special tape and put on this new coating over it. Um, and our water loss was, and, and that was a little bit scary in the moment, um, but our water loss was substantially better this year, even accounting for rainfall changes. Um, and the algae issue was just as bad. Um, staff spent a lot of time scrubbing the algae, um, but it was not as bad where the where the new coating was. So our 
our theory on the algae is the um, the old liner has just gotten more porous over time, and so despite the chlorine levels being appropriate, it doesn't kill the algae. Somehow, it's able to you know protect itself. So we're going to try to do a little better this year. What we're going to do is we're going to drain the pool completely soon and scrub it out real good with, with various chemicals, essentially bleach, to try to kill the algae really well, and then refill it just before the ground freezes. And then again, in the spring, when the ground thaws, drain it, scrub it again. Um, hopefully, we can make some headway there. We also have a theory next year that um, we have a chlorine pump. And chlorine, we can, we can essentially over chlorinate the pool on a Saturday night when it closes. Um, you leave the pump on, and then in one day, that chlorine level can go back to, say, some level. So we're, we're, we're going to try early in the season hyperchlorinating one day a week when we can to see if that helps. Um, but the biggest thing is we think this coating made a real difference. The challenge is, um, there's a couple challenges. The first is we'd like to see how it lasts for winter. Um, companies, the company is telling us eight to 10 years is a reasonable life expectancy, but we'd like to just see it for a winter at least. We haven't done that. Um, so, and Katie is, did Katie stick around? No, she will not know she had to leave early. <laughs> so we're trying to get creative to prolong their use of the pool because a new pool is many millions of dollars in short. Um, I'm not requesting to to do this work now and buy it now. I'm just putting this as a budget preview. Um, and again, the big challenge is even if this makes it into the 2025 budget and approved but and is approved by the voters, um, we might find that in 2025 when we open the pool that it did not wear through the winter very well, and we would just not buy it. But we think it's going to be fine. So we just wanted to give a preview that we think this low fifty thousand dollar investment can, can buy us some useful life um, and can help with the algae issue um, the other the other issue this helped with last year is temperature we don't have data on it but um, 2023 the pool was typically in the i don't think it hit 70. i don't know useful in there or something i don't think it hit 70. it was a water the temperature the water temperature was in the mid 60s most of the summer yes. um, this year, it was, I dare say, 10 degrees <laughs> on average. And that's the big complaint. You fill the pool, get it ready sort of just before the, the campers come in, and then they were starting swim lessons at 8 o'clock in the morning, and it's 58 degrees. Yeah. Um, this year, it was dramatically better. So again, just wanted to preview all this. Um, but I think this will be something that, um, I think this buys us a lot of time. I think that explains a lot of it. That helped, but we think the water loss was more of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're pumping in cold water and cold all the yeah. Okay. Essentially costs. I don't remember a day in my childhood I didn't jump in that pool and it was freezing. Right? It gets getting soft. Well, that's because the, the minute they put in a new liner, it failed. Yeah. So we've had massive water a lot of water to yeah. put in. Since mm -hmm. you're yeah, since my child was such. Hmm. That's what I would tell Adam though when he complained. <laughs> Your mother did it. <laughs> so, Tom, are you proposing to to put uh, forty seven thousand dollars into the budget uh, so that you can you'll have the option of uh, investing in this new uh, material? Yeah, I wanted to introduce it and have a separate conversation. But my thinking is this would go into the draft budget, and if it survives and makes the meeting day, then uh, we'll go from there. Um, but I'm I'm reasonably well sold that this is this is the investment that simply buys us a reasonable amount of time. And, and from Alex's work and, and and all the time and energy we spent on the pool, we feel like um, it's not going to fail tomorrow. Um, it's going to fail sooner or later, but this buys us quite a bit of time. Mm -hmm. And this addresses the major issue of the water loss temperature and the algae. So right. from my perspective, forgetting the water loss, forgetting the temperature, when you drive by the pool, it looks terrible. It's the elf. And it's not, it's not a lack of staff effort. It's not because our chlorine pump can't keep up. It's just 
Um, there's something else going on, and, and the only theory we have is again the forest mist. So it gets embedded in the uh, with the power loss. No? Okay. Did we ever have a conversation with um, the state about moving our pool activities to uh, Waterbury Center State Park? Yeah, yeah. The so, area. Yeah. Not a serious one. I had a few initial ones, and, and the initial reaction was positive that they'd be willing and able to have some form of agreement where we, um, you know, something like Waterbury residents can go for free in the state that tracks it and back spells us the regular entrance fee. Um, at the time, I was thinking more if we lost the season due to construction or maintenance on the pool. We would, um, in the short term, we'll have the opposite problem because we're doing work on the reservoir. Yeah, two years, years right? um, I forget if it's one or two years. So I think it's a, a good year. I guess my, my follow-up mm -hmm. question is, is it, would it, financially speaking, would it be more worth it to us to pay for that than continue to dump money into this pool that I guess mm -hmm. seems to be consistently losing us money and will consistently lose us money? The pool loses fifty or $60,000 every year. We'll always lose money. There is there is not a pool, except for St. Albans, which has, an in, which has a year-round pool, which pays for it with most of the local option tax to service the debt. And you've only got a year or two of experience. Every other pool loses money consistent with ours. So there's, there's, and that's been the trend for, that's been going on for decades. So I have no illusions that, that somehow, you know, the team of year can turn that around. Mm -hmm. um, I think the issue with the state is easy to have a program where Waterbury residents went for free and they back their loss, but much harder to do things like swim lessons yeah. um, mm -hmm. in there. And then our day camp is the real problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the heart and soul of day camp is the pool. Mm -hmm. Great. We, we did use the Waterbury Reservoir for the day camp for COVID. Mm -hmm. And right. yeah, they dive cars can't see the bottom. Yeah, right. There's no diving board. There's no lines. <laughs> you just walk the rest. Mm -hmm. And it, in some ways, Kane, it was great because that's the place that I'm going to take the kids on the weekend. So getting them swim lessons up there was almost a benefit. Mm -hmm. But from a safety perspective, there's a lot of kids. So mm -hmm. It was a big order for the for the staff. Yeah, and then even my first summer here, we um we canceled a bunch because of weather, but we did a field trip to one of the state parks on Lake Champlain. Mm -hmm. And the feedback I got from everyone was, and, and that's historically we've done that. The feedback I got from everyone after sitting down was, we've always done this from a staff perspective and a leadership perspective. It's terrifying to do that. 150 kids, some on the lake. 2023, the lake was you know, not that clear. Mm -hmm. So we killed that for this year for a reason. So yeah, the, the reservoir presents some challenges. Mm -hmm. And would this uh, application uh, ostensibly save you uh, other maintenance costs going forward? Um, I don't think a lot. We do paint the pool every couple of years. That wouldn't change with this. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's not going to save us on chlorine, which is expensive because we've always kept up with that. We still have to do that. Um, there's a little bit of time opening the pool in the spring that we deal with the winery in spring and try to figure it out. Right. And, I, and I think hopefully we'll we'll get past that. The challenge is this is this is really part one of a two part plan, which is to put this down in the shallow end um, and then and fix the skirting to go with it. But then if this works really well, the reality is the deep end has similar issues, not as bad, but it's coming. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, you're really probably $50,000 next year and then you know, three years or so, another 50 or so. But previously, uh, Alec was looking into putting in a much more expensive, uh, complete uh, stainless or PVC liner uh, for the whole pool, uh, which was yes, that's the, five plus million to right. essentially yeah. a new pool. Apparently. Yeah, so maybe that's one one of the ways you can sell this. Is uh, we're, we're not going to go after the taxpayers for five million. Uh, sorry, sorry, any questions, uh, Ian? Um, yeah, this is, this is great. It feels like it's a little bit of short money for a long term, but then we mentioned, um, 
fifty k next year for the deep end, and a couple years after that, putting more money. I I know the rec committee is proposing and moving forward with a rec facility, um, which you know seems to be generating some positive responses in town. Um, I guess my question with these investments um, and seemingly over the next couple of years, a fair bit of investment, um, is that going to come in cost to the facility? I know we've kind of put off building this because of, you know, education taxes and whatnot. Um, but I guess that's my worry by throwing all this money at the pool, which is a great resource for the town that it comes at a sacrifice for other potential. Um, do you think that's that statement's true? I think that's always true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you do you think that these investments would um uh, make a, a rec facility impossible? No, I don't I don't think that. Um if I if we didn't have a pool or a rec facility, I would certainly want a rec facility first. Mm -hmm. But I think we've got the pool, I think for you know, 50K roughly, we can string it along for quite a long time, and then perhaps another 15, a few years. So I think a rec facility is going to be a whole different, bigger conversation yeah. and then involve a bond vote. You know, yeah. the, when the discussion came about before, they were talking about $13 million. <laughs> Not seriously, right? I know it included some historical uh place and what else yeah. there was some uh, one other kitchen, kitchen and well there's another component if the, the children historical this is when this the whole right. movement whether the historical scene yeah. item is going to move yeah. down yeah. But, it, but they were talking 12 to 13 million which is a pretty significant yeah. number right. <laughs> and then the price for that what was designed in uh 2017 maybe yeah uh, has now gone up to I don't I think 19 million so um, I don't think that's going to happen tomorrow either um all right um any other questions or directions on the, the pool quote seems like a, a reasonable investment for where we are right now uh next time is the uh next meeting so we have a draft agenda for the 21st. Uh, we will have minutes from both that meeting, the uh, last meeting and this. Um, and we'll put some things in the uh, parking lot. Also, uh, we received uh, the management plan for uh, the Worcester Range uh, this past week. Uh, and I reached out to EPUD, uh, the Conservation Commission, and the Planning Commission uh, as to let them know that this is going. They, they were asking for feedback and said that they could have uh, a uh, representative of ANR come to speak to a, the select board. Um, and uh, the heads of uh, those three committees or commissions said that they could come on the 21st. So I think it might be a good time to invite a representative from A&R and create some time to review uh, the key changes and lack thereof of uh, this management plan. So I would add that. Roger, what information exactly is the board looking for in reference to the Housing Trust Fund and moving forward on that? Well, you're on the board. <laughs> uh, I understand. <laughs> well, I guess there was some question as to whether this uh, trust fund uh, gets housed uh, within uh, RW or uh, within the town. I think that would be helpful to just to make that determination. Um, and then uh, also I think the, um, the question of whether we, we are setting up something that will be perpetual, whether or not it uh, has any um, traction. 
is, is a question that, need, that we need to answer. Um, others may have other concerns, Mike? Oh, nope, I think you should. Okay. I mean, the the downstreet's involvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know we've got like a soft connection, but something will burn. Yeah. And my question was just on the funding and being clear about like, are we are we doing short-term rental share? I was proposing a higher number for the record, Kane, if we did all the rooms tax, not just the portion from short-term rentals, because I also worry about that being quickly for our short-term rental. <laughs> but just saying an alternate number could be, and then you have the proposal from Billy that we would do that as an after-the-fact contribution based on actuals versus projected, or we could do some combination of minimum of X, you know, actual receipts or blah, 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 whatever is higher. Mm -hmm. Well, we have already uh, allocated a certain amount of money on the projected revenue. Uh, and so we'd kind of be glad to put that back up on the uh, agenda. If you want to? Roger? Yeah. A point on the downstreet housing. I mean, that's really a program specific question. We're not, a, we haven't recommended the program yet. And we showed examples that we haven't recommended them yet because we don't know how much money will be in the trust fund. We also don't know if the residents of Waterbury are all set to build the way they use or did they maybe need to plan, help with planning support, in which case we would replicate a program that central Vermont Vision Planning. So it's a good question, but I would suggest that we answer that a little bit later on yeah. at the point of talking about what that's fair. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, where are you, Joe, with uh, your education series? So we apply for the grants at the end of September. We haven't heard we haven't heard back yet, but we'll, in our next meeting, what we're going to do is take the feedback that we heard from the open forum. And you know, we had a list of eight, 10 topics and we're gonna narrow that down so this issue. Okay. But we hope to start it in January of of twenty twenty four. You know, after the new year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just for the record, uh, the, they came to you. So uh, the uh, community invited us to apply. So yeah, that's usually a good indication that uh, yeah, yeah, good likelihood of a positive response. Yeah, uh, we're also looking at. I know this would require select board approval, but are we also looking at having the voters, you know, weigh in with a question on the warrant, you know, for the expenditure on um, the. Um, uh, that, that is a good question. I don't know if we can get that determination yet. There was, a, there was a meeting that we spoke, I think it was two meetings ago, that because the local option tax this year was not accounted for in our budget, that it was the decision of the select board, but next year it's a decision of the voters. Right. That's that's where I think, because we don't have, you know, an interim time where we would right. make a decision, but for longer term, I think right. we always might play it. Why way. am I thinking about a one time payment? Now, before we have to like start turning it into a budget item, is why I've been so heavy handed about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I understand. And I guess the other piece of that might be for this year is that we're looking to have the budget in place uh, by uh, the end of the year so that we can have a special meeting or convert one of our regular meetings into a meeting uh, exclusively about the budget and invite uh, the public to come in and nitpick on uh, each line arm. No, nitpick is not like that. <laughs> um, Really? Really? Oh, yeah. Joe, I don't know how these work, but doesn't someone actually, you know, have to write down what the program is, what the eligibility, what the rules yeah. are? Don't, yes. don't we have to do something like that at some point? Yes. So that was the last part. We said that once the, once the trust fund is established and funded, then we will come back with this other like innovation for specific you first spend the money, then you figure out. Well, you're not spending the money. The money is being exactly. allocated. Allocated. Yeah. I mean, it's a big difference. Again, fifty thousand dollars and two hundred thousand dollars is a big difference in terms of how you spend that kind of money. I mean, right? If you have fifty thousand dollars and thirty eighty thousand dollars in one video program, well, we need money units. So we're going to do the same. 
So we need to know how many. I just don't know. I was just thinking first figure out what the rules are. Any of them, but okay. Right. All the trust is is the line item, right? So here's this money. It's it's reserved for this purpose. Okay. And then if whatever we allocate to it, we figure out where, like exactly as Joe said, if it's fifty thousand. Maybe we, you know, there's a system where we can give it out two thousand two thousand dollar units that are lumps. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But like if you have two hundred thousand dollars or hundred thousand dollars, you can do something significantly different. Well, and I'm uh, somewhat uh, on Billy's side of, of this is that I do feel like in order to justify this to our taxpayers, I think we do need to document and thanks to Joe and others for the data that has been presented as to what's the justification for taking this fund and allocating it to the trust fund. And I think we're, we're getting closer here. Uh, on this. Joe, uh, one question for you. I'm um, wondering, uh, you mentioned you haven't reached out to any local uh, employers, uh, like large employers that might be interested in uh, matching uh, the funds that are allocated by the town. Uh, is that something that you plan to do? Um, we like people level. So, it would just be interesting to know. Um, so, thank you. And we'll put that on the agenda. Um, anything else that we should move up from the parking lot? Uh, the joint uh, joint meeting with EFRAT. Uh, this is something that uh, we need to do because uh, of insurance. Of insurance, yes, yeah, health insurance. Yes. I'm wondering if we could do that in a before uh, the meeting on the 21st. I know that uh, Skip said that he was available on the 21st. Uh, would the uh, meeting at 6.30 uh, for a joint meeting before the select board meeting? Yes, I thought you were gonna say an earlier date, which I would have objected, but. No, yes, earlier time, time. Mm -hmm. very different. So you want to have a joint meeting that starts at 6.30? Mm -hmm. I heard that right, it's about now. Yeah, I would suggest six. Six? Yeah. yeah I mean, we got 18 to 20 percent of the trends increases. So yeah, I might be. Like, I'm going to be virtual for this meeting regardless. I'm going to be at BLI in Burke, <laughs> so I will zoom in. Um, uh -huh. But I said I agree. You need the time. So start at six, and I'll try and sit down. Yeah, we need more than a half hour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah. One of the failures of my lately submitted minutes was Woody Ave. I will say, having just said what I said, both personally, selfishly, and in terms of the length of the meeting, I don't think a full. Originally, we had outlined doing some discussion, continued discussion in this meeting about goals for the project on Woody Ave. Mm -hmm. It wasn't on the agenda. I feel like, in light of Joe's, my proposal would be that we have just a discussion, like a kind of what we did at our last meeting, just revisit of the project and potential goals, um, but not a full shebang community engagement. And we pushed that to the fourth. Acknowledging some of that is personally selfish, but I will go with the whims of the board, but that would be my proposal. Uh, so you want a discussion on the 21st and then- uh, And then also on the fourth. Also on the fourth, okay. Would be my proposal, um, if we think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I just chuckle every time I hear Woody ass. Yeah, I think it was Toy Story. <laughs> um, and then we had a meeting uh, with the, uh, John Malter of the Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee uh, and uh, Tessa uh, Yip of uh, CREW uh, last week. And uh, I believe the result of that was that uh, the Preparedness Committee is going to finish their uh, draft of the handbook, which I didn't realize wasn't finished. I probably should have uh, before I sent a copy uh, to crew. Um, so they're going to, the fairness committee is going to finish their draft and then report it to crew to get their input. And then we're going to revisit this on the 4th of uh, November. I'll okay. read a draft job description for a uh, coordinator. So, yeah. I'm sorry, that was in the parking lot, Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee Handbook. That's now on November 4th. Yeah. So two meetings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just, yeah. Yeah. I think that's correct. Well, that was my understanding coming up. 
All right. Or the mini pumper for the fire department. Yep, that just came in today, but um so I need to be addressed uh, next uh, on the twenty first. Could work. Yep. And then I'd like to get on the agenda, I think the twenty first to work. I've got to confirm with Dan Sweet, but um just a reappraisal conversation. Okay. All right. Anything else? Anybody that uh, what's the ACO fee structure again? Um, there's a change in the animal control oh. fee structure, and I need to have you all prove it. But was I, that just for the state change? Is, fees? Right. There's a change in the state fees, and there's a page in the ordinance that lists the fees. So we're going to have to just amend the fee structure. It'll be very. Yeah, don't amend the ordinance because we, we made it. No, 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 I don't want to amend the ordinance at all. Just the page of the fee structure. Uh, you want to set a target date for that? Mm, yeah, sometime late November after the election. <laughs> <laughs> you, you do have something it's else really going on on November 5th. That's why it's in the parking lot. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so fine. I forget. Yeah, but... well, that's, uh, we like to yeah. issue tickets in the, in the parking lot on the regular. Yeah, this is specifically for licensing. Okay. Great. Yeah, so it's going to be done by January 1st. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how about the rental uh, registry outreach? Anything we need to be done on that? I'm personally saying if we're starting at six, it feels pretty full from what I've written down. But yeah. that's just my hot take. <laughs> I, I think we have a full, full agenda. Can you, can you get down the street another yeah. couple of meetings? Okay. Well, what more did we need to do as we, in our last meeting, where we discussed the registry okay? The look of the that form, I guess the application. We're fine with the registry. We're fine with the questions. It's a question of how we make sure property owners know that they need to submit it. So are we going to mail everyone a postcard? Is it an FAQ on the website? I did see Stowe just paid 38K yeah. to a consultant who's managing their online system. Mm -hmm. um, I, Mike Bishop is working on a system for us. So just for me, I want to like know what the system is just so that we're getting fewer or town staff is getting fewer confused phone calls <laughs> down the road. Want me to put together our plan and send it to the board, and then if you think we need a meeting, I think that's great. And I don't think we even need a meeting. Oh, I just want to make sure there is a plan and it's happening because can't really like text my gov. We did it. It's lurking. There wasn't really a plan, and so avoiding. <laughs> it's a big policy change that I think we're going to get feedback on. So just making sure our T's are crossed, I's are dotted. Mm -hmm. You guys going to take advantage of those cheap postcard fees? Uh, Every door direct? Just keep it away. Mm -hmm. Is that the one I picked up at the post store? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I like that one. Oh, I think they're going to drum up some things. We're going to, well, it's an election. Do they have one of those those new I voted stickers? Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so. I was hoping to work with the schools or Makersphere to have some kids design stickers, and I just can't seem to get it off the ground. Mm -hmm. So I did buy some on Amazon though, Mike. Okay. But I took this from the library. Your vote is your voice. Yes, yeah, it seems to stay yeah. out the library. I like them. Old fashioned ones. Mm -hmm. You do know, right? I'm not going to be at the meeting the day before the general. I assume to me, I'm sleeping. Okay. Anything else? Do we need an uh, uh, executive session? We do not. All right. Uh -huh. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. Move and second. All in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned.